Okay, welcome to the second video of our March 25th uh, qualitative research session. So uh, this video is about quality criteria and qualitative research. And I think sometimes when we talk about quality, we get a little bit mixed up uh, in two different things. Sometimes we're talking about assessing the quality of qualitative research as a reader. And sometimes we're talking about producing high quality qualitative research as a researcher. And so these two concepts are intrinsically related because theoretically, if you're assessing as a reader, you're assessing what the researcher has done, but they're not the same. And I think it's useful to, to distinguish them. So I've structured this video to start off with a general discussion about quality and qualitative research because it's a kind of a controversial topic. So I'll give you a bit of a background about some of the points of tension or, or points of conflict in the field. And then I'm going to move on to discussing some of the strategies for producing and assessing quality. And I'm trying to keep this high level uh, reviewing different um, methodological and amethodological visions for quality, talking about some of the um, big strategies that you might have heard of rather than kind of getting into the weeds about, um, you know, the, the, the particular details about how you might do this. At the end of the module or the video, I'm offering you a few specific visions of what high quality research might look like or the elements that might be included or considered. And at the risk of spoiling the punchline, um, there's no agreed upon standard of quality in qualitative researcher in research. So really as a researcher, it's up to you to decide what quality uh, research looks like and how you're gonna work towards achieving that in the context of your specific project. Um, this is something that I think is really important to consider when you're designing and conducting research in terms of thinking about this in the context of your comprehensive exam or in the context of reading qualitative research. Uh, I think that the high level understanding of what's the landscape, what's the, the main points of controversy, where is there room for somebody to say these are the criteria that I'm following and this is what uh, this is how I achieved them rather than having to adhere to some sort of a priori uh, third party criteria that's the most important important thing. A lot of the content that um, is in this video uh, are covered is, is covered in this paper right here. So this is something that I wrote with a, a former master's student. And in this paper, we're writing specifically about the challenges of appraising the quality of studies conducted by other people in the context of an evidence synthesis. Um, but before we get there, we kind of lay out some of the key tenets or some of the key controversies uh, of quality criteria and qualitative research. The other thing that's offered in this paper is a list of a number of tools that have been created to assess or appraise the quality of, of primary qualitative research studies. And so if this is a topic that you're interested in, looking at some of these tools uh, will give you the, the sense of some of the diversity of approaches that exist out there. All right. So um, I think that we could say that there's, there's kind of three camps of uh, visions of, of quality for qualitative research. There's some people who think that um, it's absolutely impossible to evaluate qualitative research with uh, standardized criteria that are created outside of the particular research topic. So this is um, the man who's who's on the um, the left of this picture. There's some people, and this is represented by the woman in the black coat, who think that all research should stand up to the same criteria and that those would be the criteria that we use for quantitative uh, research. And then there's this big mucky middle that says that qualitative research can be evaluated by a priori standardized criteria, but it requires its own criteria, but that it would be possible to come up with criteria that are applicable to all qualitative research. And um, there's a whole bunch of people who are kind of in this in this middle camp um, and, and a variety of different stances in this middle camp, too. They're not they're certainly not a unified or, or a monolithic group. Uh, Denzin names these groups, uh, the non foundationalist group, the foundationalist group and the quasi foundationalist group. Um, and I have a, a reference to this paper at the end of the, uh, this, the video, and I've also uploaded it to Avenue if you're interested in reading more. Um, so this is Norman Denson. He's uh, sort of a, a famous qualitative uh, methodologist and has been one of the, the editors of these sage handbooks of qualitative research for, uh, for many, many years. And this is a, a great source of um, some really foundational knowledge written by some of the key, the key figures in the field. 
what Norman uh, <laughs> or Dr. Denzen has to say about equality criteria is that the standards for assessing quality are forms of interpretive practice that enact a politics of evidence and truth. And I think that um, this is absolutely true and explains some of the, the controversy that we see in this field uh, and also explains some of the tension between quantitative uh, research, especially in the sort of evidence-based medicine, uh, evaluating appraising studies, grade criteria, that kind of thing, that there, that there is this sort of political nature about what is truth and who can know it and who can produce it and, wh and what does it mean. Um, and I think really getting into that argument is beyond the scope of this, this short video, but it's something that I'd be uh, happy to talk about sometime. Okay, so if we think about these, these three different groups, the uh, foundationalists, non-foundationalists, and quasi-foundationalists, let's think about uh, who, who tends to hold these visions and, and what some of the strengths and weaknesses of, of each of these are. So let's think about the um, uh, non-foundationalists, the people who think that it is impossible to have any kind of quality criteria for qualitative research. So we typically tend to see this, um, this approach from people who participate in methodologies or approaches which deeply value researcher subjectivity, like autoethnography. Um, a challenge of this approach is that it can be so relative. Um, like really is it for any individual to set the criteria for their own research project and as long as they as an individual researcher judge that they meet those criteria then everybody else should should accept that and think that the research is high quality um i think that personally i think it tends towards a relativism which is which is very challenging um, a strength of this approach is that it recognizes the diversity of approaches, both methodological and philosophical, and the way that this diversity shapes the research, and the way that it's it's key and it should shape the research, um, both in how it's conducted and how it's interpreted, and also correspondingly how it's appraised. In terms of uh, the middle group, the quasi-foundationalists, about qualitative research living up to its own criteria, but but it being possible to construct some criteria that qualitative research should should live up to. Um, I think that this is the most common stance in qualitative health research. We we in this field really like to have guidelines and procedures and, and steps by steps. Um, and so this is something that you're likely to run into in the field of, of health policy. Um, a weakness of this approach is that sometimes these uh, tools or these checklists for evaluation can gloss over some really important differences between methodologies uh, in their attempt to assimilate all qualitative research into, in, into the same categories that could be evaluated. A strength is that the criteria that are typically presented in these checklists often focus on the usefulness of the research and so can be can be applied broadly. So um, typically the folks who are constructing these criteria do appreciate the controversy and the diversity of the field and so they try to construct criteria that, that fit different methodologies. Sometimes, kind of. Um, the the um, non-foundationalist sorry, the foundationalist group, the folks that think that all qualitative research should be evaluated with the same criteria, the criteria for quantitative research. Um, this is something that I think that we see less and less as time goes on, um, more people recognize that qualitative research is a different thing that requires its, its own methods and its own evaluation. So really when we encounter this, we're most often encountering it from folks who just aren't familiar with qualitative research. These are the people who live and die by the, the pyramid of, of evidence and, and see ex qualitative research as expert opinion that is, you know, not really has has a place in this. Um, I think a weakness of this approach is that it overlooks the difference in the aims and objectives between different approaches to research. And in terms of a strength, um, I couldn't really come up with much. I thought that maybe it would make qualitative research more credible to quantitative research. It certainly gives you in, in detailed instructions, but I, I don't really know. Um, this is a, an approach which uh, most people who do qualitative research would, would really disavow and, and not see much value in. Um, so there's some, certainly some typical, some common, some prevalent approaches to quality. Um, when you look across these different, uh, whether it's methodological or amethodological criteria, we see some commonality about looking for theoretically sophisticated findings, looking for findings which are useful, which are resonant with the experiences of, of people who are in the participant group, whether or not they were actual participants in that research, um, that the findings are original, that there are steps taken towards credibility.
credibility and trustworthiness, that there's some kind of acknowledgement about the researcher's role and relationship in the research, and that enough details are provided that the reader can evaluate the resonance between data and conclusions. So these are the things that I see coming up over and over again when we think about approaches to quality. But there are so many different ways that people try to achieve this. So I have just listed some here as a, a, a way of giving you a sense of some of the common strategies. Um, but really, these are um, something that you'll go to your methodological text or your, your methodological guidance to understand how they think that, that these should be achieved. Okay, so um, switching gears slightly, we're going to talk about critical appraisal. So this is the idea of appraising the quality of research that you didn't conduct. Um, so this is, I think, a crucial topic for health policy because we're working within the health system, because um, we're often doing qualitative research alongside quantitative research to be considered holistically as part of a policy solution or a policy problem. And so in this, in this field of health research, we're kind of uh, side by side with different paradigms uh, about what can be known and how do we know it. For instance, evidence-based medicine come up with this all the time. And this is really where critical appraisal comes from, is from evidence-based medicine. It was developed uh, for causal or hypothesis testing research. Uh, it focused on experimental design and, and logical inference. It presumes a hierarchy of worse, better designs, that pyramid, which naturally will lead to worse and better quality evidence. So hold on to this idea because this is really important, the link between design and the quality of evidence produced. We'll come back to that. Um, the need for qualitative, uh, sorry, the need for critical appraisal is reinforced by the strategic use and abuse uh, in clinical research. So there's certainly a fear of bias uh, from authority figures, from pharmaceutical companies, um, these types of groups where we're really guarding against bias. And there's also lots of problems of equipoise or uh, where evidence is a disciplining influence on, on overzealous theoreticians or what, you know, what, what is reasonable to do in, in, the, in the name of evidence or developing evidence. So here we come back to this basic premise that the methods uh, that are reported can warrant the results as true or not. And I think that this does hold true for experimental hypothesis testing studies. When the, when the causal mechanism is plausible and accounted for, if you uh, follow the methods that you report, that should let us know whether your results are, are true or not. But it doesn't really work for qualitative studies because we're not testing hypotheses. There, we're not doing causal research, so there is no causal mechanism to, to test for. Um, so it's sort of this foundational assumption of the, the relationship between methods and, um, and truth um, doesn't fit this approach to research. And here we have a metaphor, and this metaphor is from uh, Mita Giacomini, but I find it so useful, so I've, I've continued to use it. Um, so Mita asks us to think about research as cooking. So when we're appraising quantitative methods, um, it's kind of like making a loaf in a really reliable bread machine. You choose the ingredients, but the rest of it is automatic and the result is very reliable. As long as you have the same ingredients, the same recipe, you're going to get the same bread at the end. And in this paradigm of quantitative research, the recipe tells you almost all of what you need to know in order to know about the quality of the product. If you know about the machine and the flour and the salt and all this kind of stuff, the temperature it was baked at, the humidity of the room, you can predict what, what you're going to get at the end of it. And so just to, to translate the metaphor a little bit, if we're thinking about ingredients, we're thinking about data, your study design is your, is your recipe, and your machine could be your analysis or your stats. And as long as all of these things remain the same, anybody should get the same results. The, the person who's running the machine, who's putting in the ingredients, is almost superfluous. You could put anybody in that position and they would still get the same results. It's really the design and the procedures that tell you what you need to know about the quality. Qualitative research is a little bit different. It's kind of like producing this perfect artisanal sourdough baguette. If you give a bunch of people exactly the same ingredients in the same oven, you're going to get a totally different products. So you will get everything from perfection to Play-Doh. The same ingredients here and the same recipe don't produce the same bread. And how we judge the quality of the bread is tasting it, right? We can't just, we can't just look at the recipe and know, and know what it's going to produce. We've got to taste that bread. 
we can ask questions about the, the procedure, about what they did, and, and we can appraise the answers. We can say if we think that this is going to work, if it sounds reasonable. Um, but it, don't, 